Well, good morning. Good to see you here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're so thankful that we have the opportunity to gather for worship, and we're glad to, to have you here. And if you're a guest, join us. We're excited to have you with us, and we just want to get to know you a little bit and connect with you. So out in the foyer, there's this uh, small card that says Connect Card on it. And if you just take a moment after the service to fill that out uh, and then take it over to our Welcome Center, or if you just want to go straight to our Welcome Center, which is right to my left in the next hallway over, um, there's cards over there. But we just want to see how we can pray for you. So if you have a prayer need, please put that on there. If you have a question about the church, put that on there. But uh, also over in the Welcome Center, we have a gift that we like to give you. So uh, we're so glad you're here to join us for worship. And let me just welcome those that are watching online. And we're just thankful for you to join us today. We're excited to, to have the capability to do that. And so uh, we're thankful to uh, be able to broadcast our services online. And let me just say, if you're in the area locally and you don't have a church home and you're watching online, please come and join us in person. We'd love to have you and to be a part of the family here at Red Mountain. Well, let me share a passage of scripture with you as we begin. It's from Psalms 20, verses 6 and 7. It says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven. With the saving strength of his right hand, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You know, a lot of people place their trust in many things in this world, but we know what God has done for us. He has saved us. He answers us. He gives us the strength we need. And the only true place, the only significant place, the only lasting place to put our trust is in Almighty God. As we worship this morning, I just want you to remind you who God is to you. And what he's done in your life and how he's been faithful all these years to watch over you and provide for you and take care of you. And most importantly, if you know Jesus as your Savior, he's given you, given you salvation. And so as we worship him this morning, remember his name and, and just continue to put your trust in him. We're actually talking about that some in the service, I mean in the message this morning. So uh, I just want to remind you about that as we worship together. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for who you are. Lord, so many people place their trust in many other things in this world. But they all fail, whether it's money, whether it's people, possessions, whatever it is. But Father, you're the only one who doesn't fail us. And so, Lord, I thank you for all you have done for us and all you continue to do for us. I thank you for who you are and praise you for who you are. And I pray this morning that we're reminded of the importance of putting our trust in you each and every day. And just in who you are, that we remember your name each and every day. And Father, I pray this morning as we gather for worship together, that we're reminded of that very thought this morning, that we have come to worship you, the one who is faithful, the one who is holy, the one who is, who is gracious and merciful to us and, and provides for us and answers us and gives us the strength we need day in and day out. May we truly worship you this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. Let's start off this service by uh, praising the Lord. We're standing and singing this song. What a friend we have in Jesus. Still I refuge, take 
to the Lord in prayer. To thy friends, these spies will say. Good morning. As we go into our prayer time, I do have uh, several things I want to share with you, but I want to start by sharing a thank you card. And it says, thank you so much for the books and words of encouragement. I have been reading in the books and the words of encouragement are always there when I need them. <clears throat> I'm blessed with such an amazing church family. Thank you and uh, it's love to you all, Colby Sanders. And we're just uh, happy to be able to see Colby back there this morning as he continues on uh, with what the Lord's got him doing. Uh, and starting off with our request, we do want to celebrate something right off the bat. Congratulations to Don and Judy Stancil, who are celebrating their 56th wedding anniversary today. So let's celebrate that. And uh, Sue DeBlanc had her gallbladder removed on Friday. Praise the Lord. Everything did go well and just continue to pray for her as she recovers. And also praise the Lord that Lumpy Compton came home from the hospital on Thursday. So just continue to pray for Lumpy as he recovers as well. Another praise uh, to the Lord that Greta Parker came home from the hospital on Friday. So continue to pray for her as she recovers. And just be praying for Luke Pearson. He recently had another MRI on his back in preparation for some more injections for pain relief. The doctor has decided not to go any further with that treatment at this time because they have found a cyst that's concerning them on Luke's right kidney. Uh, and she wants that removed. So now he'll be having more imaging done and will most likely be referred to a kidney specialist. So just pray specifically that that cyst is benign. And with its removal, Luke's uh, back pain will stop as well. And just be praying for that whole family. And, and, and in that, continue to pray for Kim Pearson as she recovers from COVID and is now being treated for pneumonia as well. So just be praying for Kim and the whole family. Continue to pray for uh, Lloyd Gresham. He did come home from the hospital this week, but had to be taken back on Friday. I know they're going to be getting an update about 10 or 10.30 this morning. They're going to be calling and getting an update. So just continue to pray for Lloyd, uh, that his strength will come back uh, and that uh, he'll, he'll be uh, feeling better soon. And be praying for Robbie Yao and his family because his grandfather, Joseph Yao, passed away on Monday. And also pray for Bonnie, Sam, and Ali Parrish because Bonnie's husband, Danny, and Sam... And Allie's father passed away on Wednesday. So be praying for that family. And of course, we do want to continue to pray for what's happening in Afghanistan. Just be praying for the Christians there uh, who are being persecuted, as well as all the Afghanistan people who are dealing with this, this tragedy, tragedy right now. The Taliban has openly said they'll burn alive any Afghans who have converted to Christianity. And they're also killing any Afghans who have a Bible app on their phone. So they're going seeking that right now. And if you would like to give financially to help with Afghan refugees, you can go to the International Mission Board's website to give there. Uh, the website is imb.org, imb.org. So just be praying for that whole situation. And obviously, as we say every Sunday, continue to pray for God to bring revival to his churches and a spiritual awakening to our nation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just thank you for this day and uh, just allowing us, Lord, to come together and worship you in your house and what that means lord the ability to freely worship uh, we should be reminded more now than uh, any time recently lord what it means to worship you freely as we see what's going on in afghanistan uh, lord we have members that are sick this morning we have members that are recovering but the one thing that we know we are all doing right now whether we're here physically in this building or whether we're at the hospital or whether we're home recovering lord is we're worshiping you as a body and, Lord, we thank you for that ability. Uh, for the ones that are healing, uh, that you're healing, Lord, and they're in recovery, Lord, just continue to uh, give them strength. Uh, for the ones that are uh, in the hospital, ones that are dealing with issues that are coming up, Lord, I pray that uh, your hand of discernment would be with the doctors, be with all those that are dealing with it, Lord. And, and just most of all, Lord, that uh, your, your hand of comfort be felt there and healing, Lord, that only you can bring. I pray that uh, you'll be with Pastor Dave as he brings your word this morning, Lord, the message you've laid on his heart that it opens our hearts to see what you would have us do this week, Lord. For we're a people of action, and we should be a people that move, Lord, because you would tell us to move and do what you tell us to do, Lord. So open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, Lord, to be ready to hear what is coming this morning. We pray this in your precious son's name. Amen.
Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Esther chapter 6 is where we are this morning, Esther chapter 6. And while you're turning there, Cameron is so gracious, I told him to add to when he shared Colby's thank you note that I was given that weeks ago, and uh, man, you know, sometimes you stick it in that coat pocket and you forget about stuff. So yesterday when I was doing Danny Parrish's uh, memorial service, I found that thank you note. So I apologize for hanging on to that for weeks. Um, but uh, we are thankful for what God is doing in Colby's life. And also, I just want to give praise. It's good to have Garnet Ellis back with us this morning. So we praise the Lord for that. As you know, Garnet, 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 if I say your name right, <laughs> Garnet had COVID and, and pneumonia, and so she's doing better. But now um, she's doing like a lot of people that have had COVID. You know, it takes a while to get your strength back. So continue praying for Garnet. But I know she's excited to be here, and we're excited to have her back with us this morning. Esther chapter 6, as we continue on through our series in the book of Esther. I recently read a story, a true story about a man by the name of Gary Tyndall. Uh, he was charged with robbery. And uh, he was standing in a California courtroom before Judge Armando Rodriguez. And there in the middle of his proceeding, he asked the judge if he could go use the restroom. And so the judge granted him permission to go use the restroom. Of course, the, the deputies escorted him down the hall and they were staying outside the restroom uh, while he was in using the restroom. Well, uh, Tyndall decided that he was going to escape. So he climbed up into the ceiling, one of those grid ceilings like we have over in some of our classrooms, and, and uh, he began to crawl across the piping and across those ceiling tiles, and, and he went down about 30 feet, and then you know what happened, those ceiling tiles gave way and he fell through. And he landed right back in the same courtroom, right in front of, in front of Judge Armando Rodriguez that he had just left. You see, Gary Tyndall thought he was in control of things. He thought in his mind, I'm going to escape. And I'm going to leave and I'm going to get out of here and do what I want to do. But he quickly realized that he was in control of nothing. Somebody else was in control. If you think about it in our lives, we sometimes live that way, don't we? We forget who's really in control. We think we're in control of our lives. We think that we are, we are the master of our, of our own lives. And we think that we, whatever we want is going to happen. Whatever we desire is going to happen. Whatever we want to do, we're going to do. But this morning, I want to remind you, we need to remember who is truly in control. And we know that to be God. That God is in control. Although we go through life and we think we're in control, we have to remember we're not. God is sovereign. God is always in control. And we need to remember that because if we remember that and live that way accordingly, it totally changes the perspective of how we live our life. It changes our life for the better. And so we're talking about this morning as we continue in our series of the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, you think about Haman. Haman thought he was in control, didn't he? Haman thought he was the one that was running the show. Haman thought that, that he was going to have his way. Now, remember what, what that was happening. I know it's been a few weeks since we've been in Esther. But, but Haman, he secured permission from the king to have all the Jews killed on a certain day. And, of course, when Mordecai found out, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, he, he goes to the, to the king's gate. And he's in sackcloth and ashes. And word gets back to Esther. Because he wants Esther to realize what's going on. He wants Esther to do something. Because remember, she's the queen. Mordecai is a nobody. And so Esther is challenged by her cousin Mordecai to step up to do something. And of course, that phrase that is so famous, that God has placed her there for such a time as this. And so we realize that, and we come to Esther 5 last time, we looked at this a few weeks ago, that, that epic scene of Esther, she approaches the, the king. Now remember the danger in that. Nobody could go to the king uninvited without him lifting his scepter. Otherwise, they'd be dead. But if he lifted his scepter, then her life was saved. So she was putting her life at risk to go before the king uninvited on behalf of the Jewish people. And thankfully, and God ordained, the king raised the scepter and he saved her life. And basically, he gave her a blank check. He said, whatever it is you want, I'll give to you. And we know that, you know, the account, if you remember, she said, I just simply want you and Haman to come to a banquet that I prepared for you today. And, and so the king agrees and he orders Haman to appear at the appointed time. Now think about it, Haman being so prideful, being so arrogant. He's excited. He's overjoyed that he and the king alone have been invited to this private banquet. But remember what's eating at him. Mordecai is eating at Haman. Because Mordecai refused to bow down and to give respect and homage and devotion to Haman. So at the advice of his wife, what does Haman do? He has those gallows built. Because he's going to kill Mordecai, isn't he? And he's thinking that tomorrow, Mordecai's body is going to be hanging from those gallows. 
So as we come to Esther chapter 6, we're reminded of who is truly in control. It's not Haman, as Haman will soon find out. And although God is not mentioned, we've talked about that many times, we see in this passage in particular that God is in control, that God is truly sovereign, that he is behind the scenes working to bring his plan about. So as we go through our life, we need to remember who truly is in control. And for us to truly remember who's in control, there's several things that need to happen in our life. And the first thing is this, we need to trust God's timing. If we're going to remember that God's in control, we must trust his timing. Now, the king was the most powerful man in the known world at the time. And he commanded 127 provinces there in the Persian Empire. But there was one king who had greater authority than him. There was one king who ruled a greater domain than him. And of course, that's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, almighty God. The ruler of this universe, the one who created this universe. And although this pagan king was totally unaware of it, God had him right where he wanted him. God had zeroed in on him, and God had him cornered. Look what it says there in verse 1. That night, the king could not sleep. I love that phrase, that night. And as you're going to see, that phrase is quite significant. Think about it. While all of Susa slept, that night, the king has insomnia. Of all the nights to be able to sleep, what's so significant about this night? What is so important about this night? Now, think about it. The king at this time knew nothing of the plan to kill Mordecai. It was Haman's plan, which, which he would reveal to the king that next morning because he needed to get the king's approval. So while Haman was asleep, while Mordecai was asleep, while Esther was asleep, while all of Persia slept, on that night, the king couldn't sleep. What was it that kept the king asleep? I mean, kept the king awake. Maybe he was concerned about the affairs of the kingdom. Maybe he was curious about the anticipation of this second banquet that Esther had invited him and Haman to come to. Maybe it was the noise of those gallows being built that were going to hang Mordecai's body. We don't know. We're not told what kept him awake. But one thing is for sure, that that night, God is the one who kept him awake. God, if you will, some people put it this way, God slipped his hand into the glove of history and he kept the king awake. On that night, as if God, the one who never sleeps, he says, you know what, king? You're going to stay up with me tonight. Many would just pass by that phrase that night and think it's insignificant. They would just say that's just a random coincidence that the king couldn't sleep that night. Friend, there's no such thing as random coincidences when it comes to God. Because you see, God does everything on purpose. God does everything for his purpose. And God has his purpose in mind when he does things. And it's that night that's very significant. It was the night after that first banquet that Esther and Haman and the king had together. And the night before the second banquet. It was the night in which Haman had the gallows built that day. And the night before he planned to suspend Mordecai's body 75 feet up in the air for everybody to see his dead body. It was a night just, just an, it wasn't just another night. Because it was significant because God was working this night. God is at work every night. But on that night, he specifically interrupts the king's sleep. Why did God choose that night to interrupt the king's sleep? It was because God wanted him to catch up on his reading. To discover something important that he had forgotten about. Let's go on to verse 1. Let's start again. That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. The king didn't lack ways to entertain himself. I mean, he could have, he could have had all sorts of ways to entertain himself. He could, have, he could have brought in musicians to play music to make him go to sleep. He could, have, he could have brought his guards in and say, you know what, let's play cards together until I get tired and go to sleep. There's all sorts of ways that he could have done this. But what does he do? He directs for a certain book to be brought to his chambers, to be read to him. Not just any volume, but the volume that recorded a very specific instance in history that happened five years ago that involved Mordecai. Now look at verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. As the king listens, he suddenly begins to remember this incident that took place. The plot to assassinate him that was discovered by Mordecai. And he uncovered that plot and he reported that plot. And then notice what happens in verse 3. Then the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said nothing has been done for him. Suddenly, the king realizes Mordecai, who saved his life, you know, Mordecai, who had made this discovery, had not been rewarded. Now, if Mordecai hadn't made this discovery, think about it. The king would have no problem sleeping that night because he'd be dead, wouldn't he? 
But the king was saved because of Mordecai. A, a, a man who at this point meant nothing to the king at all. But now, because of what he just was read, he becomes the king's top priority. Now remember that when Mordecai uncovered the plan to kill the king, he received nothing. But remember at the same time, who was promoted? Haman was promoted at that time, wasn't he? Haman did nothing, and then Haman got a promotion. It seemed unfair, it seemed unjust at the time. However, had Mordecai been honored five years before this, the events of that night would have never taken place, and the deliverance of the Jews would not have happened. So the king inquires, how do we reward this man? Have we done anything for the person who saved my life? And he's informed that nothing's been done. Mordecai had gone, un gone unnoticed, he'd gone unappreciated, he'd gone unrewarded until that night. Maybe I was speaking to someone like Mordecai this morning. Maybe you feel unappreciated. Maybe you feel unnoticed. Maybe you thought you deserved that promotion, or you deserved that raise, or, or you deserved the recognition for a job well done. But it went to someone else who wasn't deserving of it. But you can be sure of this. When you do things for the Lord, and you live your life for the Lord, and you serve the Lord, when no one else notices, God always does. God always notices. When no one else remembers, God always remembers. We, he sees when no one else sees as you serve him. And he keeps excellent records. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God will not forget when you serve him. God will not forget when you live your life for him. Understand this. God's delays are not his denials. We sometimes get impatient. We wonder why God, why, the God who could step in at a moment, the God who could do something. Why didn't he step in? Why didn't he do something? Why didn't he recognize this? We wonder sometimes. Why is it the, the wicked succeed and the righteous seem to suffer? But remember, we have to trust God's timing. God is not in a hurry. He's long-suffering towards the wicked. You say, why is that? Because he desires for them to repent and to be saved. That's why. And he's patient towards us, his people, because he wants us to receive his just reward at the right time and for the right purpose. Friend, if you feel slighted, if you feel ignored, if you feel unappreciated, make no mistake. God has not forgotten you. It's just not your time yet. But when that night comes, God will more than make up for it, for your good and for his glory. So what is in your life that you're struggling with that you need to trust God and his timing? You're trying to rush it along. I've told you many times when I try to rush along what I want to do, when I think I'm in control, I just blow it. I mess it up. And we just need to step back and trust God's timing. And trust him to bring about his perfect timing. And when you do... It shows that you remember who's in control. There's a second thing I want you to see. We need to trust God's plan. Not only trust his timing, but we need to trust his plan. Now, I love this point in the story because the tables begin to turn on Haman. The man who, who thought he was the big man on campus, the man who thought that, that, that he, was, he was everything, quickly realizes he's not that big after all. As soon as the king realizes Mordecai is the man who saved his life and nothing's been done to reward him, his wheels begin to turn of how he can reward Mordecai. Look at verses 4 and 5. So the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the court, uh, the outer court of the king's palace to suggest the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. Now isn't that interesting? Haman just so happened... To be outside the door of the king's house at just the right time. Remember, in God's eyes, there is no coincidences. God brought that about. The very moment Haman comes to, remember why he's coming? He's coming to get the approval of the king so he can kill Mordecai. But at the same time that Haman's coming to get approval for Mordecai's death, the king is deciding to reward Mordecai. The sun's barely coming up over the horizon. And here comes Haman rushing to the palace to secure the permission to finish off Mordecai. I'm sure maybe Haman thought something like this. You know, the earlier the better to kill Mordecai. And then we can hang his body up on those gallows. And all the city can see Mordecai hanging. But suddenly out in the inner court, Haman's invited in. Maybe he begins to think, now's my chance. Boy, this is working out good. This is going to be easier than I thought. 
He looks out the windows. He's going in. Maybe he sees those gallows and he thinks, in just a little bit, Mordecai's body's going to be hanging from those gallows. But before Haman can get a word out, the king speaks and fills his ears with some very unexpected words. Look at verse 6. So Haman came in. The king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now, look at this. Now, Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight, delight to honor more than me? Boy, he's so humble, isn't he? This is such a man of humility. No, he's arrogant. He's prideful. When the king asks this question, who's the first person that Haman thinks about? Himself. Of course, who else would he think about? I mean, Haman was a guy that he carried around his, his portfolio of all his accomplishments so he could brag on himself. He was a guy, if you went to his house, every wall had a picture of him on it. It was all about him. That's who Haman was. Who else is, is more important to the king than him? Now, knowing the king must be ready to throw, you know, so much lavish and, and, and blessings in his lap, Haman becomes, comes with this elaborate description of what should be bestowed upon himself. Remember, he thinks he's going to get this. What glory can he imagine for himself? So look at verses 7 through 9. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Can't you just see Haman there standing just beaming? He's just waiting for it. He knows he's getting it. And then comes the words that he thought he'd never hear. Look at verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested. He's just smiling. But then listen. And do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits in the king's gate, within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Boy, talk about taking the air out of your balloon quickly. Haman thinks, wait a minute. This has got to be a mistake. Did he just mention the name of that Jew that I so greatly hate? Did he just say that I'm going to be the one who's going to go and give him the robe and bring him the horse and I've got to lead him through the city and praise him? Friend, that's an ultimate in-your-face humiliation, isn't it? Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. The words of Solomon from Proverbs 16, 18 are fitting here. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. As far as Haman is concerned, this is the ultimate humiliation for him. This is the ultimate demotion for him. He was coming to the king's house to get Mordecai removed, and instead he leaves the king's house, and he has to go and he has to reward Mordecai. Let me share a truth, truth with you that I see in Haman's life, and if we're not careful, we will think this way too. But here's the truth. We need God far more than God needs us. We need God far more than God needs us. If we're not careful, we'll begin to think like Haman and we'll, be, we'll begin to think that we're irreplaceable in the grand scheme of God's, God's plan. That God can't accomplish his purpose. That God can't accomplish his kingdom if it wasn't for us. We'll carry around our personal portfolio of all the spiritual accomplishments that we've achieved and we'll be glad to brag about, look what I've done for God. We'll think how valuable we are. We think that, that the, the body of Christ couldn't function if it wasn't for us. But the truth of the matter is that none of us are irreplaceable. None of us are indisposable. God can do what God wants to do with or without us. We need God far more than he needs us. God will always find someone to serve him, whether it be you, whether it be me, whether it be someone else. I'm not doing God any favors by my service to him. But hear me on this. But God is doing me the biggest favor by saving me from my hell-deserving soul and giving me the privilege of serving him and having a small part in his eternal plan. What a privilege it is to serve God when he doesn't even need me. Now try not to grin as you imagine this following scene. Look at verse 11. Get the picture in your mind. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him. Now, now I doubt he does this with excitement, but look what he says. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Can't you get the picture? He's probably pulling that horse through and he's just got his head hung down low and thus shall be done for the man who the king delights to honor. No doubt those words tasted like gravel in his mouth. There was no one that he hated more than Mordecai and yet here he is, he's ending up honoring Mordecai. What goes around comes around. 
doesn't it? Well, the Bible says, a man shall reap what you sow. Things had gone around for Haman, and now they're coming around for Mordecai. Mordecai receives his overdue promotion for sparing the king's life and saving the king's life. But did you notice how the king referenced Mordecai back in verse 10? Look again what it says. Do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. The king refers to Mordecai as the Jew. Had the king forgotten that he had given Haman permission to have all the Jews killed? One day the king is the enemy of the Jews. And now here he is. He's honoring one of the Jewish leading citizens. But the king has a debt to pay. Because Mordecai saved his life. Talk about an amazing turn of events. All because God is bringing his plan about. All because God is in control. God is sovereign. Heard about a man who was shipwrecked on an uninhabited island. And he managed to, to get some belongings together from the shipwreck that had washed up on shore. And he built him a little hut to keep himself out of the sun and out of the rain and, and the cool of night. And to protect those possessions he had. And he was there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And he kept praying to God, God, would you send somebody, would you send a ship to come save me? And the next day, no ship. And he'd pray and pray and pray. God, would you send a ship for someone to come save me? No ship. Then late one evening, he went out to go look for food and went down the beach. And he looked back towards his hut and he saw this pillar of smoke coming up from his hut. And he ran back with horror. And there, his entire hut was engulfed in flames. His, His little fire he had for heat had caught the hut on fire. Burned his hut to the ground and... Got rid of all his belongings. He was mad. He was upset. He went to sleep that night crying out to God saying, God, why did you let this happen to me? God, why did you let my hut burn down? God, why did you let me lose everything that I had on this island? The next morning, he woke up to find a ship anchored off the, off the shore. And as he couldn't believe his eyes, he began to hear footsteps. And these men were coming that had come from the ship. And he said, how in the world did you find me? And they said, we're just passing by. We saw your, your smoke signal. See, what that man thought for destruction turned out to be his deliverance. You may feel shipwrecked on the island of injustice in your life. And every hope that has sheltered you, it seems like it's gone up in smoke and, and nothing's left. But friend, God can take that very thing that you thought would ruin you and God can revive you. You can't. But friend, God can Because God has a plan. You see, what the devil means for your disgrace, God can turn around by his grace. What Satan means to to make you a bitter person, God can use to make you a better person. What Satan means to, to cause you to flounder in your faith and to give up, God can use it to flourish your faith and to grow you. You'd be wise today to quit trying to make sense of what you don't understand and realize you don't have to understand it all because we don't understand all God's plan. But when you trust God, and you remember who's in control, friend, you can stand on that promise. The promises of God are true. God is going to do what he sets out to do. God will do what he's promised us to do in his word. Listen to what it says in Psalm 75, 6 through 7. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. Friend, God has a plan. We don't understand it part of the time. Sometimes we don't get it at all. Sometimes we just get a little glimpse of it. But he calls us to trust his plan. And when we begin to trust his plan, we remember that he truly is sovereign. That he truly is in control. Are you trusting God's plan? Are you trying to do life by yourself? And I can tell you from experience, when I try to do life by myself, and I try to live as if I'm in control, and I'm, I'm trying to live by Dave's plan... I just blow it up and mess it up big time. But when I seek to trust God, I seek to trust his time, and I seek to trust his plan. And I remember that he is sovereign. I remember that he's in control. And while it may not make sense to me, that's okay because I'm not God. But I know he's bringing his plan about. Friend, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's when you begin to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. I've talked to several people this week about different things. Several of them going through some very trying times in their life. You know what they told me? I prayed to God about it. And God gave me peace. You know what they're doing? They're trusting God's plan. 
One more thing I want you to see. We need to respond properly to God's sovereignty. How do you respond to know that God is sovereign? How do you respond to know that God is in control? I mean, think about it. Hammond had everything that a man could possibly want. He had position. He had authority. He had fortune. He had family. He had power. Different possessions. He was a man of great affluence. A man of great influence. But remember what he admitted himself? All that meant nothing because he didn't have the respect of Mordecai. But now have the tables turned greatly. He went to the king to have Mordecai killed, but instead he leaves the king as, as having to be the one who, who rewards Mordecai, the one who honors Mordecai. He wanted respect for Mordecai, but he ends up giving respect to Mordecai. I want you to notice how Mordecai responds to all this, though. His newly found position, his newly found prestige, his honor that the king has given him. After Haman places that robe on him, and after he gets him on that horse, and he leads that horse through the city, and he says, look, look at Mordecai, this is what the king does for those whom he desires to honor. Look what it says in verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. Mordecai finally receives the proper recognition that, that he deserved. An overdue promotion. He saved the king's life. And instead of waking up and, and, and thanking himself and, and walking in front of the mirror and singing how great thou art like Haman would do. What does Mordecai do? He goes back to his place of service. He goes back to where he was at the king's gate from where he came from. How do you handle when God blesses you? How do you handle when God gives you a promotion or God gives you prosperity? How do you handle it? Are you still humble for God like Mordecai? And trusting that God is sovereign, that God knows what he's doing? Or do we get like him and our head gets big? And we can't fit through the door to get in the house. Because our head's so big. We get so prideful. Would we be comfortable like Mordecai at the king's gate? Or would we think, well, you know, well, now the king honors me. I need to go live in the palace. That's where I deserve to be. You see, the true test of a person's character is not how you respond to poverty. The true test of a person's character is how you respond to prosperity. You know why a lot of people in America don't think they need God? Because of their prosperity. When things are going good, people, even Christians, forget about God. They think, I don't need God in my life. I've got it handled. But for you let the bottom fall out, what do they want you to do? Would you pray for me? I just lost my job. Would you pray for me? My husband just died unexpectedly. And they return to God. You see, people think they don't need God in their prosperity. That's a true test of our character. How we respond to God when we're blessed. And sometimes when God blesses us, well, as he did Mordecai, we respond the wrong way. Mordecai responded the right way. He remained humble. He continued to do what God was calling him to do. You know, I'm convinced the reason that some of us may not receive the, the, the promotion that God wants us to give us is because God knows we wouldn't handle it properly. You may think, God, why can't I live in that house? God, why can't I have that job? God, why can't I make this salary? God, why can't I serve in that position? Because God knows we wouldn't handle it properly. We have to check ourselves. Let the Holy Spirit, to, Holy Spirit speak to our lives and see if we're responding the right way to what God is doing in our life. Regardless of how blessed you may become, never lose sight of where you were, of who you were before God found you and saved you by his grace. After his royal and regal trip around the city, Mordecai just says, drop me back off where you found me at the king's gate. It wasn't a big deal to Mordecai. Honestly, he could care less about this. Mordecai went back humbled. But notice what happened to Haman. He went back humiliated, didn't he? Remember the last time Haman went home and he was bragging about how great he was to his wife and to his friends? He called his friends over and he's bragging about how great he was. But notice this time, it's like he kind of slithers in underneath the door, sniffling, whining, complaining. Look again at verse 12 and then at verse 13. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife's arrest said to him, If Mordecai, listen to this, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Human fa I mean, Haman failed to see it. God was trying to get his attention. 
had he turned his heart towards God in repentance, he probably would have said something like this, Lord, you know what? I was wrong. You taught me a valuable lesson. God, you crushed my spirit, and I'm thankful. Now teach me to rely on you. But he didn't. He responded with, with pride. He responded. It was all about him. But people like Mordecai, I mean, people like Haman, it's always someone else's fault, isn't it? It's always, you know, someone else's fault. If it hadn't been for that person, you know what? I've done more to deserve it than she does. It should come to me. People like Haman are, are, are seeking self-justification to avoid accountability for their actions. It's never their fault. There's always a reason why it's someone else's fault. So Haman recounts all that happens to him and what he hears from his wife. Boosts him from being humiliated, really, to being horrified. I mean, you've got to admit it. His wife, she had ice water running through her veins. She told it like it was. She didn't hold it back. Now, she was a pagan. She was lost. But she had more sense than her husband. She had more sense than even the king. And she says, wait a minute now. You mean Mordecai, the man that you built those gallows for. You mean to tell me that he's a Jew? And then there's no way that you can win against him. You're a dead man, honey. You see, he's the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's one of God's chosen people. You picked the wrong man to mess with this time. Because God is sovereign. God's in control. And as they're discussing this, about that time, there's a knock at the door. They didn't finish the discussion yet. Look what it says in verse 14. While they were still talking with him, the king's units came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Remember Esther's request with the king after the, the first banquet? That she would prepare another banquet for the king and for Haman. And at that banquet, Esther is going to reveal the plot that Haman came up with to kill off her people, to kill off all the Jews. And the king would also find out about the gallows that, that Haman would construct, had constructed to, to murder Mordecai. And the man that he had just promoted because he saved his life. Remember that? We're going to see that. Not, some, not today, but in the near future. When the king found out what Haman's intentions were, he would have Haman hung on those very gallows he had built for Mordecai. My, how the tables have turned. Hammond's going to the palace for his last meal, and he doesn't even know it. Friend, God is always in control. God is always sovereign. God slips his hand in the glove of history. He says, you know what, Hammond, time is up for you. It's judgment day for you, big boy. It's time to settle your account. Now, I don't know, and I can't tell you when your last day is going to be. I can't even tell you when my last day is going to be. But there's going to come a day when we're going to breathe our last. And you're either going to stand before Jesus as him being your savior or as him being your judge. Remember what the king said? What honor have we done for this man that has saved my life? Let me ask you, what honor have you given Jesus Christ? For the one who has offered you salvation. For the one who has given you salvation. If you know him as your Lord and Savior. What have you done about Christ? What, what have you done with Christ? What have you done for Christ? I heard about a king one time. That he gave his court jester a scepter. And he said, I give you this scepter to show you, you that truly you are the king of fools. Now that's encouraging to hear from your king, isn't it? But he instructed the jester to, to keep that scepter. And he said, now, if you ever find a, a fool that's greater than you, you give him that scepter. Well, sometime later, that jester made a long trip. and He was gone for a long time. And when he returned, he found out the king was deathly ill. And so the jester came home from that journey. He went straight to the king. And, and he asked the king, he says, have you made any preparations for what's to come? And the king said, well, I'm, I know I'm going on this long journey, but, but I haven't made any preparations. He hadn't done anything to prepare for his death. You know what the jester did? He handed that scepter back to the king. He said, in all my travels, I have found no greater fool than you. Take your scepter back. Foolish is a man who becomes so preoccupied with his life that he makes no preparations for the life to come. Are you prepared for the life to come? Friend Hammond wasn't prepared. He didn't respond well to God's sovereignty. And as we're going to see... Not today, but Haman does lose his life. 
Remember who's in control because one day you're going to stand before him. And as I told you, you're either going to stand before Jesus as, his, as him being your savior or as him being your judge. Are you prepared for that day? The only way to get prepared is to trust Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior, to ask Him to save you from your sins. Because we all have that same problem with sin in our life. And, you know, we live in a society where we don't like to talk about sin anymore. Sin's a, a now a, a bad word to say. Or we redefine sin. It's not my fault, it's my mama's fault, it's my daddy's fault, it's my co-worker's fault, it's my boss's fault that I do these things. Friend, we are all born with the same problem, that is our sinful nature. It goes back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. There was no sin. And God gave them a clear command. Don't touch. Don't eat from that tree. And what did they do? They did it anyways. They disobeyed God's word. That's what sin is, is we disobey God's word. And the Bible tells us because Adam and Eve sin, that sinful nature is passed down to all of us. And don't think you don't have a sinful nature. I shared this yesterday at the funeral. I said, and I've shared it many times here. Two toddlers, one toy, you will see the sinful nature come out. Nobody has to teach that toddler to bite. No one has to teach that toddler to slap, to fight for that one toy, do they? They just know how to do that. Why? Because we're born with that sinful nature. It's our sinful nature to disobey God. And because of our sin... We cannot have a relationship with God. We cannot get to heaven one day because God is holy and he can have nothing to do with sin. But God provided a way to make it all possible. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the punishment for our sins because there is a punishment for our sins. And that punishment is an eternity in hell, a place of torment separated from God. But God doesn't want us to go there because it wasn't even created for us. It was created for Satan and his demons. But Jesus, God's son, he came and he lived a perfect life. He lived a sinless life on this earth. And he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. And he took on your punishment. He took on my punishment. He took on the punishment of every person who ever has lived, is living, and will live. And he died for our sins. But he didn't stay dead. He rose three days later. And that proved that he's the son of God. That proved that he came to do what he said he was due. And it's through him and him alone. That we can have salvation from our sins. We can have forgiveness. And if you haven't done that. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. I'll be glad to talk with you. In just a moment I'll be down front. And I'll be glad to talk with you about that. I'll be glad to pray with you. Show you in scripture if need be. But don't leave here without Jesus. How do you respond to God's sovereignty? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you responding like Haman? I don't need God. I can do it on my own. Or are you responding like Mordecai? That was totally dependent upon God. But Christian, let me ask you, do you remember every day who's in control? It's easy for us to forget it. It's easy for us to go about our day. Pastor Cameron shared this last week. You know, he's, he's like me. He's a list person. You know, I, I, I have a legal pad either today or tomorrow morning. I'll sit down and write down my list of things I need to accomplish this week. And usually I start with about two columns on the front side. By the end of the week, the whole back side's filled up as well. And if I'm lucky, I can get it accomplished, but... Most often, I don't get accomplished what I want to do because it's not about me. But what God does, and God did it a lot this week. He said, Dave, there's your list. Let's have fun with that. Because he's in control. Let me give you an example. Some of y'all know Danny and Bonnie Parrish. And as you heard, Danny went to be with the Lord this week. I didn't know that was going to happen. Bonnie didn't know that. Danny didn't know that was going to happen. But Danny was prepared because he knew the Lord as a Savior. So that got thrown into my week. But that's okay. But you know what happened yesterday at that funeral? Two people got saved. That's because God's in control. God's sovereign. Now what if Dave was in control? Wouldn't have the same outcome. I'll tell you that. Do we live like God's in control? Father, I pray this morning that we honestly evaluate our lives. And we ask that question. Do we remember who's in control? And Lord, if we're not living like it, may we do what we talked about. Begin to trust you like we should. Your timing, your plan. May we respond to your sovereignty like we should, Lord. And Father, if we're not there as Christians, help us get there this morning. Show us what we need to do in our life. And right where we are in our pew 
whether people are watching over the Family Life Center or watching online. Father, way we make it right this morning. Maybe people just want to come down to the altar and pray about what's going on in their life and trusting you to be in control. But Father, I also pray for those who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lord, that they will honestly evaluate their life and, and ask that question if they're ready to meet Jesus face to face. Because one day, we will either see him as our Savior or as our judge. And Father, I pray that no one leaves here not knowing the answer to that question. Lord, that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. As we sing, you respond as the Lord is leading you. just a moment. Pastor Cameron is going to come and share some announcements with you. We do want to remind you if you're a guest this morning, we're just thankful you're here. And we do have a gift for you that's over in our Welcome Center. So just please go over and pick that up after the service. Uh, we also want to remind everybody that our new schedule will begin in September. On, and here's how it will be on Sundays. The first worship service, this service, will start at 845 Sunday school will start at 10, and then the second service will start at 11. Nursery and children's church will start back up for both worship services. Nurseries will be, nursery will be for ages birth through three years old, and they'll meet in room 111. Uh, children's church will be for four years old through the fourth grade, and they will be uh, with us in the worship service, and they'll be dismissed after uh, the pastoral prayer. And you parents, you can pick them up in room 118 after the worship service. Uh, Wednesday night services and activities will also start back up uh, in September at 7 p.m. Uh, and want to remind you, too, we are continuing to collect for the non-perishable food items for the Yates Baptist Association Food Pantry. You can place your donations in the barrel over in the Welcome Center. If the barrel's full, just place it around the barrel. It's great to have a full barrel. And if you or someone you know is in need of firewood for this fall or winter, we do have uh, wood available. If you're interested, please see Wally Watson, and uh, we'll take care of getting that wood to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for this message uh, that you have uh, given us through Pastor Dave this morning that just reminds us that you are always in control, Lord. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are around us or what's going on. Uh, we can cling to you, Lord, in the assurance that you are in control because you are God and there is nothing more powerful you, than you. Be with us as we go out, Lord, uh, to Sunday school, uh, out to this week that we're able to show others your love by how we act and our actions and the things we say and do. We pray this in your precious son's name. Amen.